Yours, Shirley. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Bree Aldridge. Uh, Bree, please tell us about your living history. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Bree Aldridge. I'm a professor at Tufts University, and I have a joint appointment in the School of Medicine in the Microbiology Department in the School of Engineering and Biomedical Engineering. And I'm really honored to be asked to give this talk. Um, so I don't have much time, so I'll just start in on um, my childhood. Um, I'm really amazed by all the speakers and how many old pictures they have in digital form. I think I'm behind on that, but I did have this picture of my brother and me on, um, you can see the desert in the sorry. back. Sorry, Bri, um, we're not seeing your slides. Oh, hold on. Let me share. Sorry about that. I think I'd have this down by 2024. Uh, Bree, sorry to jump in. Do you want to keep it real or do you want to uh, re-record? Oh, this is fine. Okay. <laughs> Are you seeing the screen now? Perfect. Yes, we do. Okay. All right. So you can see the desert. That's me and my brother. Um, and so everything, I grew up in Arizona and I went to college in Arizona. So I was used to a very um, tan desert lifestyle growing up. Um, just wanted to give, there's a plug for public schools throughout um, my talk. I grew up in the public school system in Arizona, um, and I really had a great education growing up in that environment. Um, I'm only a year and a half younger than my brother. He's a year ahead of me in school. And so anyone who has siblings know that really shapes your experience. And he is a bit of a math whiz. And so as a good little sibling, um, I tried to distinguish myself by doing anything but math. So I, I tried very hard for a long time to hate math, um, but you'll see I kind of ended up back there in the end. I couldn't get around it. Um, my extracurriculars, I really loved music. I played violin pretty seriously growing up, doing chamber music. Um, and I mention it here because I think having those outlets and extracurriculars um, and music in particular really fits into research and the way of thinking, kind of getting into a rhythm, um, and also leadership and working in teams. So I think it's been, um, I was glad I had that in my upbringing. Um, my high school teachers, I'm not going to name them because I'm aware this is going to go on YouTube, but I had a really great experience in high school in science. I was in lots of math clubs, which I loved, um, and science clubs. But the high school teachers, you know, um, in the schools, they have a prep area in the back behind. So in the science classrooms now, they have like classrooms that are connected to each other and there's a little prep area in the back. They let me skip class and I would go into the back prep area where all the chemicals were. <laughs> and I got to just basically run my own little experiments in the back. No accidents happened. Um, and it, it was really the first time that I had teachers that allowed me to be creative. Um, maybe they shouldn't have. Um, and um, and and then I really got interested in experimentation and testing ideas out. Um, so after that, I had some really great research opportunities um, starting in high school. Um, and the first was I was really interested in um, engineering. And so I did a robotic stint at the University of New Mexico one summer. Um, and there I was introduced to fuzzy logic and also um, AI. And at the time this was in the nineties and AI was having its heyday then, and then it faded and now it's back. So um, it, it, what, it, what, <laughs> so it was an interesting time to learn about AI. Um, and then after that, the next summer I went to Jesse Martinez's lab at the University of Arizona. Um, and it was a really transformative experience with me and Jesse's lab because I was really interested in um, I loved looking for patterns and solving math problems, so therefore I liked coding. Um, but I also liked the problems of cell biology. So in his lab, these were back, I'm dating myself now, it was back in the days when you had the really long sequencing gels. So one of the first lab jobs I had was reading those like really big sequencing gels. I was doing PCR, you know, with the mineral oil at the top. Um, <laughs> we didn't have a heated lid on the top of the PCR machines at the time running mini preps. And so I was really interested in the questions, but I was missing some of the pattern finding elements and the elegant solutions. What I really liked about the coding element was 
finding a pattern, coding it up and using it to cheat my way through the system. Basically, I felt like I could short circuit lots of work by finding a pattern. And so I told him I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I was going to um, go to college. And that's when he told me about computational biology and that there was this new field coming up and that he thought if I could handle it, I should just do both at the same time. So um, that led to my college days. Um, I stayed in state. So again, really like to say that staying in state um, allowed me a lot of opportunities that I'm not sure I would have had had I um, accepted some of the offers to go to private schools. And the reason is because I was able to use lots of high school credits to do dual degrees, one in the School of Engineering and one in the School of Medicine. Um, this was before there was interdisciplinary programs. So if you wanted to do engineering and science, you had to do them as separate degrees. Um, I, but I um, really was really glad that I had that opportunity. Um, I was also lucky to have a fellowship or a, a scholarship from the Flynn Foundation. Um, and that meant that I had the ability to do research I wanted to do on the side without worrying about paying the bills because it paid room and board and tuition. Um, and so actually to try and convince me to stay in Arizona and do that um, scholarship, I was called by Sam Ward, who is a Cieligans expert. Um, he's pictured here um, with me and my son during my postdoc. I went to go see him later. Um, and he not only tried to get me to come to University of Arizona, which he was successful at, but he offered me a position in his lab. And so I worked in and out of his lab for the four years of college. And it was a really great experience um, working with him. Um, and the Flynn Foundation also paid for us to travel. So I got to see the world during my undergrad. Um, and I got to work at the National University of Singapore studying apoptosis again. And then I also got to do crazy things that I wouldn't ordinarily think I would get to do. So I took summer school at Boazici University in Istanbul. And I learned about, I know this is a group of physicists, so I took a class on algebraic wallpaper groups. So we went through the proofs of how you could, there's only 17 ways that you can organize regular patterns in two dimensions. And the fun thing about doing that in Istanbul is um, there was a lot more examples of wallpaper groups in that part of the world. And so we would go travel around the city and count wallpaper groups. Um, so I got to learn a little Turkish and a little, um, um, algebra of the sort that I wasn't used to before, but it kind of fits into this idea of the pattern finding. Okay, so at this point in my life, I got married right after this, and then we moved across the country to Boston. Um, and uh, I started my PhD at MIT in a pretty new PhD program, biological engineering. And then I did this, uh, my PhD with Peter Sorger and Doug Laufenberger. And um, I was a bit of a fish out of water when I started this program because most of the other of my classmates had backgrounds in chemical engineering and mechanical engineering. So they all had some of the similar backgrounds and they were talking about Navier-Stokes equation, which I'd never heard of because I was computer engineering major. We don't do Navier-Stokes in that field. Um, and they kept talking about transport. And I thought they were talking about trains, planes, and automobiles. I really had no idea what they were talking about, um, but I made it through. Um, I had a lot of fun working with Peter and Doug. Um, they gave me a lot of leverage to um, design new ways of analyzing how cancer cells made cell death decisions. So I was really interested in dynamical systems and bridging the gap between the engineering and intuition and biology. So one of the things we did was develop logic-based ways of doing dynamic modeling, um, not for the purpose of mechanistic modeling, but as, as a way to make it the modeling intuitive to the bench scientists. Um, and then we also use dynamical systems here. I'm showing direct Lyapunov exponents as a way to bridge the gap between mechanistic models and quantitative multivariate experiments so that we could basically make a phase diagram of cell types based on the abundance of proteins. And so this was a lot of fun. I spent a lot of time at the bench doing microscopy um, to validate our modeling results. Um, but I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit, but um, you know, thesis work is really hard. And so for those of you that are going through your PhDs right now, you know, they call it the slump kind of in the near the end, but you're not quite at the end of your PhD. And at that time I realized I wanted to 
still do research. Um, and Doug definitely sat me down and said, if you want to continue doing research, you have it in you, you should keep going. So I decided to keep going, but I wanted to work on a different problem. I wanted to transport the quantitative biology and computational biology tools that were being developed and applied for cancer biology to what I felt were underserved questions in infectious diseases. So I talked to lots of people in the Boston area about infectious diseases, and everyone said, move to infectious diseases, do not work on mycobacteria. I heard this from more than one person. So mycobacteria are causative agents of many different diseases, but the notable ones are TB and leprosy. And the reason why people don't study mycobacteria is they're really hard to study. Um, there's biosafety issues, they grow slowly, they're super clumpy, um, but the big issue really is that they're variable. So there's so much variation in when you do experiments with mycobacteria, and that was the hook that got me into the mycobacterial field. So I joined Sarah Fortune's lab at the Harvard School of Public Health, and we started to do very basic um, cell biology research on mycobacteria because it hadn't been done before. And we learned that they um, have an inherent way of growing and dividing asymmetrically, so they intentionally produce heterogeneity. Okay. So um, then I went on to start my group at Tufts University. Um, my lab is based on the Boston campus, the medical school campus, because we have a biosafety level three lab there. Um, and I'm really proud of the group that I have. And it's so much fun to work with students and postdocs and technicians in my group because they come from all different kinds of, of backgrounds in life and backgrounds academically. We work on still studying growth behaviors in mycobacterium tuberculosis. We study mechanisms of action in antibiotics, and um, a large part of the lab now studies um, drug combination design. Um, and the last thing I'll say is just a shout out to, like LaChandra said earlier, the people at home, both the, the family that are related to you and the family that's chosen, and they've been really supportive of my academic career for many, many years now. Thanks. Thank you, Bree, for a, a fantastic talk. And I'm uh, plotting on behalf of the audience. Um, so I have a, a, a question for you. So you talked about um, you know, having the experience of being allowed to be creative when you were younger and playing with the chemicals yourself. How do you, um, and you create this type of environment for other people, of course, uh, in a safe way um, uh, with the students that you're working with? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think working at the interface and work doing cell biology in an area where there's so many more open questions than we have answers to, there's no choice, but that all the folks in the lab have to be exploratory and they have to be creative in order to solve these problems. So it's sort of baked in. Um, and we also have an inter interdisciplinary environment um, with a lot of teamwork. And that's one thing I learned from being with Peter and Doug in my PhD is that having a lot of different people with different backgrounds to ask questions to and to kind of get the juices going and then allowing folks some time and freedom to, to work on those ideas um, it, I think is it's critical to to let everyone develop scientifically and have fun with it. Great uh, thank you very much. Um, 